Why did the bank shut you down? There is prejudice against me here, probably over Brexit. I mean, it is the most extraordinary hit job. Thought to be racist, thought to be xenophobic. They had decided that I was a reputational risk to the bank and I should be exited from the bank. We've not lived those war experiences that our grandparents and great-grandparents did. Do you think that could happen in your lifetime? I'm scared of China. Mm. I'm very scared of China. Oh, we're far worse than that. From 2030, 100 world governments are now heading towards CBDCs. If we have CBDCs in a cashless, digitized society, our spending can be controlled. An exploding population is a major part of our problem here. And why do people not want to talk about it? It goes back to the I word, and if you touch the I word, you must be a very bad human being. The I word being? Immigration. You right. Must, no, 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 no. Oh, okay. You brush it under the carpet, then it's not happening. Would you rather marry Greta Thunberg or Hillary Clinton and why? Oh. <laughs> Sorry. No, I'd go gay. <laughs> this is one of the most explosive conversations I have ever had. Come down the rabbit hole with myself and Nigel Farage. I'm standing with Nigel Farage and fighting against a cashless society and a central bank digital currency. If you'd like to show your support, make sure you like this video, subscribe to the channel and turn the notification bell on. Nigel, why did the bank shut you down? Oh, because I'm me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a funny one. I, I, I set an account up with NatWest in 1980, um, and I've been with the NatWest group. For, that's 43 years. To 43 put it in years, context. Yeah. yeah. And had all my personal banking there. Also, in the city, I did, when I was in working in commodities, when I had a proper job for politics, um, I, for nine years I ran uh, Farage Futures Limited. So I ran all my business accounts through NatWest. And then, about 10 years ago, they said, uh, we're withdrawing your foreign exchange facility. So, well, I'm being paid in euros. I, I want a euro account. No, no, you can't have that anymore. So I spoke to the manager in Seven Oaks, the local town. I said, that's I'm really not good enough, is it? I said, and, you know, basically, if you receive my euros, you'll change them into pounds at rates about as good as Gatwick Airport. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I was really unhappy. Yeah. He said, look, don't worry. You know, you're a high-profile person. We'll put you in with Coots, which is part of the same group. And I sort of joked and said, well, I'm not really, you know, at the wealth level of Coots, but, yeah. you know, fine. So yeah. I've banked my Coots ever since then. Uh, what has happened in the last few years, and it isn't just within the banks, a lot of it's coming from the regulator, the FCA, is we've seen this march of politicisation right. of private companies. Uh, targets for diversion, uh, diversity, for inclusion, uh, ESG, governance, uh, climate change. And you look at all this stuff and think, well, are these banks, are these commercial companies, or are they political entities? And that's really what got me. So the account was closed because I did not align with the bank's values. Wow. It was a political Have decision. you been told what the bank's values are? So, yes, basically I have. Um, they, uh, the, 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 the CEO, well, he's not there anymore. Uh, we'll come to that. <laughs> uh, yeah, the CEO said, look, you know, we're not, we're not just now about money. You know, we are about climate change. We are about inclusion. This word inclusion keeps coming back. So do they think you're not about climate change then? Is that they see well, your uh, you position know, as threatening? I am, I am deeply critical of quotas. I don't think commercial companies uh, employing or promoting people purely on their sexuality or whatever racial definition you want to give them yeah. um, is right. I, I, I mean, I've got a view, maybe it's old-fashioned. I believe meritocracy. in meritocracy. I believe in meritocracy. Yeah. I believe that if people are honest and good and work hard yeah. and deliver the results, they should succeed regardless of where they come from, regardless yeah. of their class or anything else. And, and of course, this kind of is where we were in the 1980s. There was a great belief in London in the 80s that you know, it didn't matter. You, know, you didn't need the old school tie anymore. You could get on yeah. according to your ability. So I have been deeply critical of this. On climate change, well, uh, all I've said is the pursuit of a net zero agenda will make the poor poorer. Literally make the poor poorer. Why? Well, take ULES. I mean, the ULES extension comes in two weeks uh, from now, exactly two weeks from now. It's £12.50 uh, to drive in and out of the greater London area. But I won't pay it. I've got a nice car. Yeah. It's the pensioners that'll pay it. Right. It's the people driving commercial vans that'll pay it. It's those that can't afford a new car that'll pay it. 
uh, you know, and you look all the way through this, you look at the massive subsidies that have gone into wind energy, for example. Well, all it's meant is people have had 20% added to their electricity bills. Yeah. It doesn't matter to you and me, but it does matter to people on minimum wage and people that are struggling. So anyway, all mm. this stuff. Right. You know, oh, also, I was critical of Black Lives Matter. Now, when Black Lives Matter happened, you know, in the wake of the George Floyd murder, uh, the whole corporate world said, oh, isn't this a wonderful organisation? You know, Sky Sports, whether you watch cricket, football, you know, little BLM badges in the corner. All I said was, it's a Marxist organisation uh, designed to bring down uh, Western civilization and capitalism. Um, when and you say all you said was... <laughs> well, but I read it from their website. Right. I read it from their website. Wow. <laughs> that, yeah. was, that, that was the stated aim of the organisation. So all these things were, were, were listed as a charge sheet against me. But here's the important thing. Is right. that, sorry, just to jump yeah. in there. Did you not talk about Sadiq Khan recently and his... I he, did. He jumped, he jumped on... Oh, look, I, yeah. think, I think that, that what Sadiq Khan is doing on the 2nd of September in Trafalgar Square is divisive, negative and bad. Well, can you just share what his plan is? He's having a Black Day rally where we're going to celebrate black lives and black diversity in London. This is a mistake. You see, you know, the great campaign of civil rights in America, and you could argue, actually, that in the 60s, America wasn't that far away from apartheid South Africa, if we're, yeah. being, if we're being really honest mm. about it. And Martin Luther King, that speech, maybe the, maybe the greatest speech of the 20th century, Martin Luther King says, you know, I have a dream. One day I have a dream that my four children will be judged not by the colour of their mm. skin, but by the content of their character. Right. And what Khan and others are doing, we're now being divided up into different groups. You know, you're in the black group, you're in the Asian group, you're in the gay group, you're in the bi group, you're in the white wow. group. There's a lot of groups now as well. Well, <laughs> an unbelievable number of groups. Yeah. I mean, it's LGBTQIA, and I don't, I don't know how long the list goes on now. Yeah. Uh, and I think, I think it's all a terrible mistake. I think we should all be treated equally in mm. front of the law, we should as much as possible have equal opportunities in life. That's never entirely possible because no. of where we're born and who our parents are. But, yeah. but you know, that's the kind of society that is cohesive right. and work together. And what I, what I really hate, Rob, more than anything, is telling eight-year-old white kids that they are oppressors, that they are guilty somehow for all the sins of the past. Right. And worse still, telling eight-year-old black kids that they're victims. Don't tell people that they're no. victims. Do not do that. No. Tell eight-year-old black kids you've got every chance of success. All of you have got the same level of success. So it's for all of these reasons mm. that I did that. And, and it's really funny because the word inclusion, it sounds cuddly and fluffy and lovely. Everyone's included unless you have a different point of view. Right. Then you are excluded, mm. almost excommunicated. So what happened with me, and I'll explain this because this, this, this could be valuable to some of our viewers. So I get a phone call, we're closing your accounts. I ask why. No reason given, it'll be explained in a letter. The letter arrives three days later, we're closing your accounts, we want you out of the bank by this date. No reason given whatsoever. So I wrote to the CEO and said, hang on, I mean, don't I at least after 43 years deserve some kind of explanation? And I got a phone call not from him, but from, but from a relatively senior woman within the organisation, to say it's purely a commercial decision. We are making a commercial decision. You're a high-profile individual. You know, it takes a lot of monitoring to make sure that you're, effectively, to make sure you're not a money launderer, as if. Um, and it's a commercial decision. I said, no, I don't believe that. I said, I, I genuinely, somewhere I think there is prejudice here. There is prejudice against me here, probably over Brexit, right? Which is right. one of the big divides that's, yeah. that's still there. I mean, I'm hopefully gonna get better as the years go on. But I was stalemated. I was stalemated. What anyway, does that mean? How, how well, I couldn't you... do anything. What could I do? They wouldn't give me a reason. Um, I spoke to you lots of- You could tell everyone about it like you have. Well, so I did tell everyone about it. I did tell everyone about mm. it. At which my inbox to nfarage.com became unmanageable. Just thousands of emails every day wow. from people up and down the country and all around the world saying they too had had their personal accounts 
and all their business accounts closed really? with no reason given. So I started to think. So were these a mix of well-known people and not so well-known people? Very few of them are well-known people. Oh, and, and, so and, and we'll come to the. Okay. This is multi-layered. Yeah. All right. So I suddenly begin to think something really big's happening here. Anyway, I've caused a bit of a stir. <laughs> <laughs> it then, well, this is just the beginning. <laughs> it then turns out a, a Telegraph journalist got a tip off that Dame Alison Rose, the CEO of NatWest Group, this vast organisation with 19 million customers, and don't forget, 38.6% owned by us. Yes. We bailed the them out. Pay, yeah. Our taxes went up to yeah. bail out NatWest yeah. because of their own greed and stupidity. Telegraph journalists found out that Dame Alison Rose had sat at a dinner, a big grand dinner at the Langham Hotel, next to Simon Jack, the BBC's business correspondent. Funny, nine o'clock the next morning, after they'd sat together at dinner, I get a phone call from Simon Jack on the BBC to say, I have it on good authority that there's no political prejudice here, that your account has been closed for commercial reasons, you didn't have enough money in your account to qualify as a Coots customer. That, of course, goes out. The media love it. They love it. You know, Farage is a laughing stock. What an idiot. What a joke. Why can't you just get a normal bank account at NatWest like all the rest of us? And they had a field day. Well, and I'll be honest about this. Is that not... Um, what, information that shouldn't be passed what, what, along. Well, you should not breach client confidentiality. No. I mean, if you were a yeah. junior working on a NatWest till and you breach client confidentiality, yeah. you are out the door. Yeah. You, won't get, you, know, you won't get your month's salary. You're out the door. Yeah. So she breached confidentiality. I mean, this 40-page document comes back. I mean, it is the most extraordinary hit job. Every negative press article, Russia mentioned 144 times. And, and this is communication behind the scenes in the bank. So in light of this debanking scandal that Nigel Farage and 90,000 other people just like you have had to endure, it's now more important than ever to protect your money from the banks, from inflation and from taxation. So if you'd like to beat the banks at their own game and maximise your return on time and money invested, go right now to whichproperty.com forward slash IAM. Fill in the form there, find out what type of investor you are so you can maximize your returns and build multiple streams of recurring income from property investing. And also you've been with Coots 10 years. And what, they've just decided, or well, now well, you don't well, no, meet no, no, criteria? No, no, she was the boss of NatWest. I've been with NatWest Group for 43 years. And you, you don't need to qualify, do you, to be a NatWest customer? NatWest, no. Coots, no. Coots, Coots do have a higher yeah, level, yeah, a turnover level income. Anyway, yeah. So this is the story that goes out. What I didn't know, and, and forgive me for my pig ignorance, I didn't realise that you could do data subject access requests. Oh. I'd never blooming heard of it. Yeah. No, I'm not, you know, <laughs> yeah. I'm a big ideas person. <laughs> yeah. Probably more than detailed, to be honest. Yeah. My, my critics would say so, and they'd probably be right. Yeah. But a mate had said to me, put in a DSAR. To just explain, can you just explain so to me what a that is? So, a, a subject access request is you can go to a bank or any other company and you can ask them to release to you any personal information they have on you. Mm. Okay. Including messages between... It, messages about you yes. that have taken yeah, place yeah. within, yes. in this case, the bank. Yeah. So, I put this in. Well, I mean, this 40-page document comes back. I mean, it is the most extraordinary hit job on me that I've ever read. I mean, I'm literally reading it with incredulity. Um, every negative press article, Russia mentioned 144 times. 144 times in the 40 pages. And, and this is communication behind the scenes in the bank? This is them picking out speeches made yeah. in Parliament under parliamentary privilege by a guy called Sir Chris Brandt. I wish you'd say it outside Parliament. I'd love a new house, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but all the conspiracy theory that happened after Brexit and after the Trump election that somehow Russia had funded the whole thing. And so Russia, Russia, Russia is all yeah. the way through. Right. Although, although they do say there's no proof, but it's there. Yeah. Uh, they called me... I mean, it, it, some of it was really extra, a disingenuous grifter. Well, that's a new one on me. Um, I, I mean, I many things, but I wouldn't have thought disingenuous would apply. Yeah. Oh, thought to be racist, thought to be xenophobic. I mean, it, it really was 
the most vile document. And on the basis of this document, they had decided that I was a reputational risk to the bank and I should be exited from the bank. Why now? On the commercial, I'll tell you why. Mm -hmm. On the commercial grounds, three times in the report it says he is an economically viable customer. So what Rose had said, what Alison Rose had said to the BBC wasn't just a breach of confidence, it was an outright lie. Right. Why now? Because I had a small mortgage with them that was expiring in July of this year. And so once the mortgage was gone, they said that was the moment they were going to get rid of me. That's why they did it. And, I, and the reason, I repeat the reason, I did not align with the bank's values. Well, I thought they were a bank, 38.6% owned by us. Instead, they're playing this game of politics. So that's really become a massive story. It's led to the resignation of Dame Alison Rose. It's led to the resignation of the CEO of Coots, Peter Flavel. How do you feel about that? Oh, Flavel, I mean, unbelievable. You know, I even wrote to him in May and said, I'm having trouble finding any other accounts. Other banks don't want me. I'm a politically exposed person. They don't want... Was it like nine banks turned you down? Yeah, ten, in fact. Yeah. Ten? Yeah. So I said, you know, if I can't resolve this, I will turn up at Coots with a Securicor van and I'll collect all the money in cash. I warned him. I warned him. Yeah. And yet he ignored me three times. Right. Three times he ignored letters I sent to him. So, no, look, both of them deserve to go. Frankly, yeah. the board under Sir Howard Davis are still in place. They need to go as well because they actually said they supported Alison Rose and she should stay. It was only after the government intervened that she actually resigned. You got the um, support of the PM, didn't you? The Prime Minister supported me. Yeah. Uh, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt, wrote a very strong letter to the FCA, who are the regulatory body yeah. for the financial services industry. Um, so what do we drill down from this? Number one, uh, people's accounts have been closed in vast numbers. Up to a million bank accounts have been closed in Britain in the last four years. And is this under the, the guise of a politi politically so, exposed person? Let's do the layers. Yeah. Number one is politically exposed person. There are 90,000 people on that list. There are local councillors, national politicians, senior soldiers, senior civil servants, senior people in positions where they might be a boss of a company that trades with the Middle East or whatever mm. it may be. 90,000 people. <clears throat> the object of being a politically exposed person is that you're more likely to be bribed or part of a money laundering scheme. Do you think that's the okay. full story? There is not. There is not. Well, it could be even more sinister than that, but <laughs> there is not a single example in modern times of anybody on that pet list or their family being involved with money laundering. Lots of misdemeanours, some crimes, but no money laundering. And so what we do under pet rules is we treat, we treat my kids, because they're on the list, we, so your yeah, kids yeah. can't get a bank account? Well, I, I can assure you, my family has struggled. You know? But it isn't just family, associates as well. People who are known to be associates could go on this list. Simon Heffer, who's So a, I, I could potentially, potentially with being yeah, here... Yeah, 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 that's right, you're done for, mate, yeah. The, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Simon Heffer, who is a, a, a very senior author and journalist, writes Telegraph columns, writes books. Simon went to top up his private pension. Uh, before the financial tax year ended in April, um, and got a phone call back asking a whole load of questions about where the money had come from. He said, well, it's my money. Why are you asking this? Because you're a known associate of Nigel Farage. Wow. I mean, this is really sinister stuff. Mm. It was an EU directive that came to Britain on, on PEP rules. And so we treat, we treat former Chancellor of the Exchequer's grandchildren the same as we treat African dictators or Russian oligarchs or Colombians <laughs> who've got wow. bigger. So that rule needs to change. Yeah. And I'm pleased to say the FCA are writing to all the people on the pet list to ask have they suffered with bank account closures, insurance problems, pension problems. This goes, yeah. this is wider than just banks or have your family or friends suffered. So there's a big review into PEPs. Frankly, frankly, we should of course be nervous of hot foreign money coming into the country, but if we go on treating MPs and councillors like this, or more importantly their family members like this, you'll find fewer good people want to go into public life. Mm. That needs to be reformed. I'm very scared of China. Ten years ago, China was a fairly insular 
country. Under Xi Jinping, it's a very different place. And you only have to look at the growth of the Chinese Navy. If you join Rob.team right now, you can claim not one, but two special bonuses. Number one is my eight week money mastermind university. What they should be teaching you in schools about money, but are not. And I've got two special tickets to the Money Maker Summit. The best business opportunities for recurring and passive income. Go right now to Rob.team, R-O-B.T-E-A-M for this special offer. The next big area, a massive problem, is cash. The banks willfully want to drive cash out of society. You think about it, we bailed them out in 08 and 09. In return, they've closed 5,000 branches around the country. 5,000 branches. And if you're running a small business, you want to pay in cash. You find, well, number one, the local branch is gone. It's a long way to go. And number two, from the 11th of September, NatWest are putting limits on the amount of cash you can put in and the amount of cash you can take out. And this, for small businesses, for small traders, yeah. is a disaster. I was talking to a lady the other day, her brother's got a fishing boat in the channel, she sells stuff by the roadside, she gets much more money selling by the roadside than going to the market and going through a merchant. Yeah. Average cash transaction, seven or eight quid, people give her a tenner. Yeah. Uh, they could pay by car, but the internet doesn't work there. Right. You know, I mean, go to Cumbria. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. get an internet connection in Cumbria or wherever else. Um, and so these people are now being forced into a nightmare position where the banks do not want their cash. Do you think this is merchant fees? What do you think is behind this? Well, here's the thing. I mean, if you were running a small turnover business, Rob, you know, these merchant fees are not cheap. No. They're Three, not Three percent plus. We pay hundreds of thousands a year in bank charges. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, yeah. It, it, it's not cheap. My worry, if they drive cash out completely, is the merchant fees will become five or six percent. Yeah. I think that'll happen. Do you but think it's a tax grab? I think there's something even bigger and more worrying than that going on. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, as no, you well know, I but, but, but what, could be, what could be worse than 50% tax? Well, oh, this is oh, well, far worse than that. Okay, I'm listening. From 2030, the United Kingdom will introduce Central Digital an introductory Currency. Introductory Central Bank Digital Currency. They're recruiting staff at the moment. 100 world governments are now heading towards CBDCs. If we have CBDCs in a cashless, digitised society, our spending can be controlled. What we choose to spend money on can be controlled. Where we spend it, how we spend how it, we spend when it. we spend and it. And it's already happening. It's already happening. I have had several people, <clears throat> even a 19-year-old, a 19-year-old student, right, works in a student bar to help pay his way through uni. He puts 50 quid a month into Coinbase, a legal entity, FCA registered, and he's buying coins. You know, I said, well, half of them will go bust, but you never know. <laughs> yeah. but, but, but one or two will go to the moon. Yeah. But you know, you think about Bitcoin, Ethereum, I mean, in many parts of the world now, you know, you can buy cars, you can buy cups of coffee. Yeah. Higher profile people too, putting larger amounts of money. The banks are stopping you putting money in crypto. They're already controlling. So they want, to, they want to centralize. Yep. Uh, yeah, and if you want, by the way, if you want to take cash out of the bank. I had one, I had one bloke wrote to me, very successful, older guy, made fortunes as an entrepreneur. Says to his local bank in the West Country, I want to get 25 grand in cash. Goes in to get the cash. The manager is off for the day. He was a junior manager on. What do you want the cash for? So, well, it is my money. You know, I have banked here for half a century. Yeah, yeah. I've got millions through this account every year. What do you want the cash for? He said, well, I'm going to buy Christmas presents, I'm going to buy a boat, a few... Anyway, she refused him the money. He remonstrated. He said, I didn't swear, I didn't shout, account closed. So, you know, you go and try and get a couple of grand out. They will ask you, Mr. Moore, what do you want the money for? Yeah. You know, if you tell them it's for drugs at the weekend, they'll probably say it's fine, I don't know. <laughs> but <laughs> but so, so you can see where we're going already with this. If we have CBDCs, we will all be given our personal carbon allowance. You, you want to go to Marbella for the weekend? I'm sorry, you've used up your carbon allowance for the year. I mean, you know, controlling people's money is the ultimate form of control. Cancelling people's bank accounts is the ultimate form of cancel culture. You can't live, even though I want cash to stay in the system, you still can't live 
without an active bank account, with your standing order, with the gas company, the electricity yeah. company, mm. whatever it may be. So I, I've got a very big fear here. And as I say, from the 11th of September, NatWest are putting very strict limits on what you can pay in and what you can take out in cash. I've had in the last 48 hours um, some people on to me, local businesses, Barclays in Orpington will be limiting the total amount of cash per year small businesses can put in. So it's becoming a bit of a nightmare. The other element to this is anti-money laundering laws. Okay, so we all know that the global drugs trade is tens of billions of dollars a month and that this stuff <coughs> washes around the global system. And so understandably, uh, you know, at all levels from G7 to OECD to IMF to the European Union to the Treasury, understandably, there are rules, laws put in place to try and prevent money laundering. None of us would disagree with that, mm. but you know, laws need to work and yeah. be appropriate. So under this crackpot anti-money laundering drive, you know, if you're just an ordinary bloke with a bank account, say you sell a motorbike, you get four grand in cash for it, that goes into your, suddenly alarm bells start going off. Unusual payments have gone through your account. Mm. And to monitor that, it costs the bank a lot of money. I've tried, I've tried for once to, to sort of put their side of the argument. Yeah. Cost it, easier to close the account. Easier and cheaper to close the account because the bank will be losing money on accounts that it needs to monitor. And that's probably the biggest reason that accounts are being closed is the odd unusual payment goes in. They say, look, we, you know, we, we can't send a whole compliance team to investigate Mr. Smith in Swindon. Close the account. But here's the thing, and this is Forbes that have done this work. For every one pound of laundered money that is recovered, the compliance cost is 100 quid. It is the classic sledgehammer to miss the nut. Wow. And so in the name of anti-money laundering, innocent people, innocent businesses are having their accounts closed mm. down and we're not catching the money launderers anyway. So I want to see the pet rules, best part scrapped, for domestic, you know, not for African dictators or Russian yeah. oligarchs, but for us. I want the government to make a commitment that legal tender stays as legal tender. You know, pubs in London now are refusing cash. Do you think this was expedited by lockdown and the story oh, of the virus? Of course, and, money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, I mean, you know, the, the, the cashless society advanced hugely during the lockdown. It is, I mean, you literally now could not get around London with cash. You know, whether it's buying a ticket for the underground yeah. or trying to buy a beer or a sandwich or, you know, and that's, that's not the case in the rest of the country. So I want to see, I want to see legal tender remain legal tender. Mm. Um, I also fear, you know, if everything's digitised and we get a major cyber attack from China, yeah. I, I mean, kind of what happens, you know, cash, cash, in my view, cash should always have a place in our society. Also, how do you tip the postman at Christmas? How do you, I mean, there are mm. little, little, yeah. little things like that that matter. But I also think that Parliament, and now that we are not in the European Union, and we can argue how well or badly that's going, some bit's good, some not as good as they ought to be, but that's by the by. But now that we're in charge of our own financial services industry, we need a British Parliament to go through the anti-money laundering laws and say, look, they're not working. Mm. They're hitting the wrong people. And the final thing I'm going to campaign for, and by the way, this is not a short-term fit of anger for me. This is now a long-term campaign. I'm committed to this. Yeah. Before the post office was privatised, we had the right to a bank account in this country. All right? That right exists in France, in Germany, in many comparable countries. We now don't have that right. So let's just say you're an ex-con. Now you've been away, you've been in prison, you've done your time, you come back, try and get a bank account. It's really, really difficult yeah. to get a bank account. And so, you know, you may well find in that case that person stays inside, inside the criminal world, you know, rather than sort of coming out and, 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 and getting on with life. So, so I think that everybody must be entitled to a bank account. Now there are some that would say, Nigel, how can you as a free marketeer you know, say this, because surely private companies can choose who to have as a customer and who not. But mm. the difference is we bailed these people out. Yeah. These people nearly brought, I mean, these people damaged our lives through terrible lending decisions. We bailed them out. Yeah. Our taxes went up. And actually, actually, the argument, I think, is that the right to a bank account 
it's pretty much the same as having water or electricity coming into your home. It is an essential modern service. <clears throat> I think what I've unraveled here is it's several things. But one of the biggest things I've unraveled here, Rob, is the extent to which you know, the woke culture, this new political agenda, is running not just through the public sector, but through the private sector as well. And if you could sum up what the political agenda of the woke culture is, what is it? It is, without any shadow of a doubt, uh, to push what they believe to be progressive ideas. Uh, and they're ideas that will make us more divided by s splitting us up into these different groups. And they're ideas that will make us poorer because they're not practical and they're not realistic. You know, if you work in the oil industry, your bank account will be closed. If you're a local gunsmith, your bank account may be closed. Perfectly legal activities yeah. are now not approved of by these woke corporate institutions. And it's going to make us poorer because it's not going to work. You where know, does this wokeism come from? Oh, America, the west coast of America. So this is really interesting. So where is this at its worst? America, UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. What do they have in common? Predominantly the English language. It's, it's the effect of what we've seen from Facebook and others being pushed from the west coast. If you go to France and Germany, <laughs> there's, there's, no, woke, there's no. no woke in Italy. No. There's none. Right. It doesn't exist at no. all. So it's a very much a thing that we've caught from America. Um, and we get, I mean, to be honest, we get lots of good and bad from America. But, but, yeah. but this is, this, this is the, yeah, the West Coast have sent us this and we're living with this. And do you think this is because society's got, it's been relatively easy, hasn't it, society, for quite a few decades now. We've not been fighting wars. Because yep. I try and think about this. Are, are people not busy enough doing important things? Because if we were all fighting in World War Three, then we wouldn't be worrying about what yeah i know what letter we I add know, on to lgbtq I, I, I mean what it is it's it's a hard left agenda driven mostly by marxism which wants to abolish borders abolish national identity it doesn't really believe in national democracy as a concept believes that we should sort things out at a bigger global level um and it's been able to force its way because natural conservatives have, have just been cowardly. You know, you know, if you don't approve of this measure, it means you want to destroy, it means you want to destroy the planet and your children and your grandchildren you know, you know, will all die because we're going to raise by five degrees. And, and, and throughout all of this, people have retreated. And the winners, in many ways the winners of all of this, have actually been the big businesses, have actually been the big banks, because the environment they create is so anti-competitive for the SMEs, the small and medium-sized businesses, to actually be able uh, to, to, to maintain a strong position. And I, I want to argue very strongly that we need to return to capitalism. Now, the word uh, alarm bells go. But, you know, but we're not living in capitalism. No. We're living in corporatism. We're living in an age, and collectivism too, mm. but an age where big government, big business, big banks work hand in glove. By the way, I first said that 15 years ago in the Strasbourg Parliament. 15 years ago, mm. I could see the way this was going. Uh, and I think the world is a better, happier, richer place, more innovative, if men and women have got the ability to found their own businesses and go out and succeed. That's where you get competition in price, competition in quality, innovation and ideas. And I think we sort of, <clears throat> we've turned our back on all of this. But I wouldn't Why? be- Oh, because I say this, this leftist agenda has been pushed and everyone, you know, no one dares stand in the way because you get called nasty names, and my Twitter mob attack you, and all of those ah. things. But you know something? Pendulums, all through history. Mm. We Overcorrect, get, overswing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, 1658, in this country, you could be imprisoned for overtly celebrating Christmas. You know, if Cromwell's men broke into the home and you had decorations up over the fireplace, that was it. You'd be dragged off to the neck. Yeah. And by 1680, uh, we'd sunk into Hogarth's Gin Lane. <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah. Total drunken debauchery <laughs> yeah, in London. Yeah. So the pendulum yeah. was going in the 17th century all over the place. Um, and I think there will be a massive turnaround in, in what happens in the corporate world for this simple reason. You know, you can read all this guff that ESG investing and not investing in fossil fuels. And they, you read all this stuff. 
you can read about diversity, that you promote people within a team on the basis of, of not their ability but where they come from or what group they're in, that somehow this is going to make us richer and more successful. Do you know what? I think, if I look at the banks and the kinds of people now being promoted, I, I think the next banking crisis can't be far away. You know, if you're over-promoting people without the ability. So in the end, I think it'll be the pension funds. I think it'll be the big investors that say to companies, you know what? Forget about all this political stuff. Just do your job. Mm. Just do your job. We're your shareholders. We've invested money in you. We expect to see a profit and a dividend. That's kind of how the world has always worked. Mm. And, that yeah. is, and by the way, I mean, do you, do you remember just three or four years ago, modern monetary theory? Do you remember that? Modern monetary theory. We can borrow as much as we want yeah. as a government or a company or a person because interest rates are zero. Modern monetary theory. We can money grows on trees. Anybody talking about that, about no, modern monetary no. theory now? Nobody. This is very much the same. The pendulum will come back on all of this, and I, I really hope. I mean, all I've done, all I've done, is to say something in public that a lot of people in private knew was happening mm. and didn't know quite how to fight back. So, but I do feel, Rob, that I've, I do feel that I've sparked a genuine debate here, and I want to emphasise something as well. This is not political. This is not left wing, right wing. This is actually about <coughs> you know, the freedom of the individual in society to be able to live their life free of hassle, to set up their own businesses, to make their own way in the world. And they, all of that has been seriously attacked by what the banks are doing and by this culture uh, that is running through so much of our private sector. And do you think, therefore, the banks control the world? <coughs> I think they're enormously powerful. Um, enormously powerful. Uh, I, I, you think of other industries, media, etc., where there's been a great fracturing of Yeah, power. the decentralisation uh, of media. Uh, We're having like the, the centralisation yeah. of banking, aren't we? Uh, yeah, just look at, you know, UBS, Credit Suisse, in the course of the last year. Yeah. You know, the banks. And there are, there are a lot of fintech companies out there and some very innovative fintech companies out there. I mean, London's full of fintech companies mm. and they're very efficient for... You know, paying and receiving foreign exchange, and you can actually buy, you know, receive money and pay money out. Mm. You can't earn interest, you can't get a mortgage. They're not full banks. Yeah. So there have been, there are specialised sectors that fintech has fitted into, but basically the global banking system is now becoming more centralised than it's ever been, more closely linked to government. And if you want an example of how this can be abused, think about Canada a couple of years ago. These guys working as truckers, truckers yeah. right? law-abiding people, suddenly the law changes, a vaccine mandate comes in, they don't want to do it. They peacefully protest in Ottawa, and guess what happens? Prime Minister Trudeau works with the banks and shuts their accounts. Yeah. You see the dangers of this? Yes. They're real. I do. They're real. Yeah. They're real. So it's a huge battle. This is a huge battle. And I, as I say, I'm optimistic we can, turn, I'm, I'm optimistic we can get this pendulum to swing back in a more common sense direction. How? I mean, well, I think the first thing is the FCA must do their job. I, I mean, this is a regulator that is there uh, to look after Britain's biggest industry, which has actually spent far too much of its time pushing political ide ideology. <laughs> so, you know, telling banks and firms, stockbrokers, you know, we're going to judge you on your ESG credentials. Ditch all of that. You know, get back to making people's savings are safe. You know, mm. and, 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 you know, they, they can actually operate freely. Um, in, in, in the financial world. Uh, I think that needs to happen. And I tell you, when it comes to politically exposed persons, well, for once, politicians actually have a self-interest in making this right. Well, they messed with the wrong guy, didn't you, they? Oh, I don't know. I, I tell you, it was funny, actually. Um, it was funny. In the 40-page dossier, they say the downside risk is that Farage goes public and causes a stir, but we think he'll probably be too embarrassed to do that. And this is what, you see, admitting in public, admitting in public your bank accounts have been closed is actually quite a shaming, humiliating thing to do. And that's why after I did it, a lot of other high profile figures came out yeah. about what had happened to them, what had happened to their families. I mean, one, there's, there's a Tory MP from Portsmouth, um, Hampshire, uh, sorry, Southampton. Um, I mean, his account's been frozen for a year. He doesn't know why. I said, why didn't you speak out? I said, well, well, Andrew Tate told me he had 15 million frozen and he said what he had to go through to get that money back wasn't worth going through to get that money back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it, it, you know, I mean, I mean, the best thing Jeremy Hunt has said 
is that in his view it's illegal to close people's accounts on mm. the basis of their opinions. Mm. Now there are, you know, take face criminal charges, so yeah. that's a slightly okay. different situation. Yeah. But 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 certainly on the basis of people's opinions, you know, the vicar didn't agree with the Yorkshire Building Society that the whole of the front door should be a rainbow flag celebrating Pride Month. You know, the, you know, the vicar popped in to say, can't you just be a building society? Account closed. <laughs> Shit! No, <laughs> Shit. no it's, this has been happening. Yeah. It's sinister and it's dangerous. And I, you know, I've received more support from across the spectrum on this than ever before. There are some, you know, loony crackers people, haters yeah. that won't agree. But actually, the number of emails that start, Mr. Farage, I don't normally agree with you, but. So I that hope must feel good. Well, after, you know, having lived a 50 50 life, <laughs> there's a spinning image um, yes. playing on in London. Yeah. And I, I haven't been, but mate went on Friday, so as soon as you appear, 50% go, yeah, 50% go, but, you know, so I've been a very 50-50 person, people mm. either really like me or don't, yeah. um, but no, this, this, this has actually, you know, brought people together, because mm. they can see the importance of this. Now, is there this upside swing of the pendulum where now media has become more decentralised? Yes, media has fundamentally changed. Yeah. Um, you know, the absolute dominance of the BBC, for example, in our media landscape is very different. They still have a significant number of followers, uh, viewers, and they still do some things very well. But podca individual podcasters can individual. have more listeners than the BBC oh, now. Oh, absolutely. Individual podcasters. Yeah. Um, of course, people with huge social media profiles. Uh, traditional television, conventional television is obviously in decline. Uh, newspaper sales are in decline. And yet... The one thing, the one thing that television and newspapers still have is the, is the power to set the national agenda. It's quite interesting. The power to set the national agenda. In terms of viewers and followers, yep, that can go elsewhere. It's quite hard. An individual podcaster, as you do, you can bring to the audience knowledge. You can bring to the, and you can bring to the audience actually guidance. You know, I mean, for example, I'd say if you're a small business watching this, open several bank accounts. Protect yourself. Mm. And not just with our bit, not just with one banking group. Because uh, people think they're insured. So this is what individual podcasts mm. can do. Things like that. What you can't do with an individual podcast is set a hair running on a national story that explodes. That still comes from the editorials in our main newspapers, and it still comes from the TV providers. That may change mm. in time. So agenda setting is still with the old traditional media. Um, in fact, I mean, our newspapers are still incredibly powerful. Mm. Incredibly powerful. You know, I mean, I, I broke this story with, well, obviously I do the GB News show, but yeah. I, I, worked, I, worked with my, I worked with my broadcast and the Telegraph. And the fact that I got, so in a sense, the Telegraph were legitimizing what I was saying to camera, mm. and before you knew it, it was, a, it was a global story. So there are big changes in media. Um, I, Do you like this move towards a more oh, decentralised media? God, yes, of course. Yeah. I mean, look, you know, let's it's, more, it. it's more free market within media, isn't it? Well, let's face it, my political career would never have taken off without YouTube. Mm. I mean, there I was in 2006 7, sitting in the European Parliament. I've been there six or seven years. I couldn't get any publicity mm. for the stuff I was doing, nothing. BBC barely covered me. Suddenly, YouTube arrives, I get up in the Parliament and give one or two very constructive, helpful speeches. <laughs> <laughs> and it explodes. Yeah. And then suddenly, the BBC and the Times want to write about me because of what they've seen on social media. Mm, on, so, a, on a platform that you control, yeah. that you can yeah. monetize. Yeah. 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 Well, I couldn't monetize it as an, as an MEP, but right. I wouldn't have tried. Yeah. I wouldn't have tried. Yeah. That would have been wrong. But, but, but no. for someone like myself, I can oh, monetize sure. YouTube as a creator. Oh, sure. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah, YouTube. And, and of course, you know, thank God for Elon Musk, because I think it's very important that we have somebody in the social media space who's got a different set of values and views to the rest of the industry. Mm. You know, Musk is providing a great counterbalance, and, and we'll see where Twitter goes. Yeah. So look, I, you know, I've got, I've got uh, 3.3 million followers across my social media platforms, uh, which is by far the most of anybody that's been in, in elected politics in Britain. Uh, Media-wise, only Piers Morgan's got more, but I suspect a lot of that's because of, of his years in America. Yeah. Mm. So I've taken this, I, you know, I've, I've been an enthusiast for this, Mm. Right from day one, direct messaging, 
uh, a means of building up an audience, and you can kind of help each other. Mm. Um, you know, a lot of my stories, a lot of my, you know, I do seven o'clock GB News Monday to Thursday. Most of my stories come from my social media followers. Right. They just go to the website and say, "Have you seen this? Have you heard about that?" Yes. So you build. I think with these platforms that you can build a relationship with people that, 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 that you can't do in quite the same way with conventional media. Mm. So yeah, media decentralization, there'll be a lot more change coming, I think, over the course of the next few years. Yeah. Uh, some of the established groups won't survive. Like? Well, I just don't see how the BBC license fee can go on the way that it is. You know, I think historically it served an important role, um, but I just don't see why the BBC should be able to use license fee payers' money to bid for football matches against the private sector. I think the private sector can do all of those things. Yeah. Um, so I don't think the BBC will be there in the same shape that it is. So you think it's dying, the BBC? Yes, I think that's pretty obvious, actually. Mm. Uh, and I think if you look at the if you look at the average age, I mean, even the Today programme on Radio 4, you know, a very important radio programme, although I can't stand Nick Robbins. I had, a, I had a bit of a barley the other day with him. Right? <laughs> you? <laughs> I enjoyed it more than he did. But, but I mean, still a very big audience. But you look at the average age of the audience, and every six months the radio figures come out for radio, and, it, and it's down, 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 mm. down. So big changes. So where we're really looking at is where do the youth go? Where do the under 30s go uh, to get their news, to form their opinions? That's the future for right. all of this. Yeah. And you know, TikTok at the moment, yeah. Very much in the ascendancy. Mm. Very much in the ascendancy. Um, but hey, this time next year, it could be something completely different. Yeah. You know, it really mm. could. But, but at least that creates a capitalist type, free market, yes. fair competition environment whereby, hopefully, the best platforms that serve the people the most will rise to the top. Provided they're not censoring too much. You know, I currently feel that Facebook are censoring pretty heavily. Right. You know, what, what they would view as conservative content, which is why Musk coming into the market mm. actually helps to free that up and a little bit. Setting up from Zuckerberg setting up threads. Yeah. 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 So yeah. I, I think that's a good thing. Sadly, the, the, um, the fight's off. Is it? Yeah, Zuckerberg's pulled out of the fight. He, he said, Musk's not serious. I'm very disappointed about that. I would, I would pay good money to watch that. Oh, I'd love to be yeah. there. I'd love to be there. I went to watch KSI, by the way, Bob. Did you? Yeah, down at the O2. Yeah. Again, amazing. A young audience, yeah. very engaged. Again, all through. So the whole new world out yeah. there. Yeah, I, I just had a fight. Eighteen hundred people. I saw. Just I you saw know, me and a little. I saw. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I won't take you on. Don't no. worry. <laughs> yeah. So there is big change, but uh, but we certainly need some. You know, ultimately, you know, money is vitally important in our lives. Mm. Uh, having control over our own money and freedom, and that's under threat. And I've mm. exposed that, and I'm going to go on doing so. Right. And, uh, we're going to get some big wins out of this. You, you watch. Okay. So I'd like to talk about the state of the UK. I was talking to my wife about this. I'm 44, she's 45, and we can't remember this country ever being so, well, your money doesn't go very far. You can't get in to the NHS. Have you ever seen this country in such a state? I do remember... 1974 five, mm. I'm a bit older than you. Yeah. And I do remember inflation getting to 27%. I do remember people's savings just being obliterated. Mm. I remember strikes. I remember the three day week. I remember doing homework by candlelight because there were blackouts. Right. I remember uh, some trade union leaders who clearly, as we've learned, were acting on orders from Moscow. I mean, it was bad. Yeah. It was bad. And, you know, this country, which only half a century before had had the biggest empire the world had ever seen, mm. was, was really, really on its uppers. <clears throat> I, oh, I forgot, income tax, top rate income tax, 83%, unearned income, 98%. I mean, mid 70s Britain was the epitome of a centrally run socialist state. Utterly failing in every regard. So yes, I have been here before. The difference I think this time is even though we didn't have much confidence in Mr. Wilson or Mr. Heath, we still had great faith in the church. 
we had great faith in the National Health Service, huge faith in the National Health Service, uh, great faith in the army. Uh, you know, we actually had great faith in the institutions of the, in many of the institutions of the country. That has completely gone. I mean, this Archbishop is turning people away from religion, <laughs> or certainly from the Church of England, in their droves. Some are heading towards the more evangelical churches who have good turnouts on Sunday mornings. Many are just giving up on religion completely. A lot, a lot of people are converting to Islam, aren't they? Have you noticed that as well? Yes, there is a bit of a trend mm. with that. Uh, I, I, Islam is a very complicated one because there are clearly sects and parts of Islam you know, that are compatible and we would respect. Mm. In fact, actually, when you look at you know, what happened in Oxford Street the other day, you might say, well, we've got great respect for something that has some rules. Mm. Equally, uh, because Islam doesn't have a proper head at the top of it, there are elements of it that are very worrying and very scary. Yeah. Um, the National Health Service doesn't work. It just doesn't work. We had 1.5 million people have waited over a month to see a GP. I mean, you could be dead by then. Yeah. Now, part of this, part of this is because we have an exploding population and no one wants to talk about it. Since 1997, the population's up nine and a half million. Million. And it's going up, and it's going up now. I mean, last year's legal immigration figures were the biggest ever, by miles. We need more and more people to come in from around the world because we haven't got enough baristas because uh, we've got 5.3 million of our own people working age not working. <laughs> we've got a massive productivity problem. I mean, our productivity, our productivity levels are lower than France's. How can that be? I've never seen a Frenchman work. <laughs> no. Huge. So actually, an exploding population is a major part of our problem here. And why do people not want to talk about it? Because they're accused Because of... it goes back to the I word. And if you touch the I word, you must be a very bad human being. The I word being? Immigration. Right. Must, no, 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 no. Oh, okay. you brush it under the carpet, pretend it's not happening. And the fact that your constituents can't get GP appointments or the roads are clogged or your kids can never have a house, we just won't talk about. So that is a big problem. And that, that, that's put added pressure. Definitely huge added pressure on the health and everything else. But I mean, look, I, I feel in summation, we're living in broken Britain. Nothing works. Literally nothing was state. Look at HS2. Look at it. You know, we're told it's going to cost, going to cost 35 billion. <coughs> the latest estimate is 109 billion. I bet you it was 150 before they finish. Mm. And it won't be completed until 2041. <laughs> I mean, nothing works. I, it was very interesting. Why does nothing work here when Dubai seems, for example, like, would you consider moving? Is See, I, I mean, the trouble, the trouble for me is, you know, I am so English, I can't help it. But, you know, I love going to Lords for the cricket. And, yeah. and, and, but you, you, and, could, you still could, couldn't you? You still could. Mm. But, but, you know, I love the English countryside. Mm. I, I like where I live. Yeah. Uh, you, know, you might have family around. Uh, yeah, here, all of those things. I mean, I suppose, But I, is it more tempting now to move than it was five years ago? Yes. Yeah. For, lo for loads of us. Mm. I thought Channel Islands suit me. Right. I quite like the Channel yeah. Islands. You can hop back and forth yeah. fairly quickly. Now, I don't want to leave. No. We, in the 1980s, we turned this country around. All right? We went from that desperate position that we were in, and we turned it around. And it was incredibly tough and very painful. Painful for people working in the coal industry and for mm. many, many others. It wasn't straightforward. But the Thatcher... The Thatcher approach that you needed to you know, literally turn economic policy on its head, uh, it worked. Mm. By 1990, we were successful, thriving, foreign. We, were the, we went, went from being the sick man of Europe to Nissan opening plants up in Sunderland to 300 foreign banks investing money in the city of London. Mm. So these things can be turned around, but you need courage and you need leadership. And I feel that's what we're lacking terribly. And I look ahead to next year's general election. Um, well, I mean, frankly, what shade of social democrat do you want? I mean, they're all high spend. They're all high tax. They're all committed to net zero policies which are unachievable, unrealistic, unworkable, and for the poor, unaffordable, with, with no flexibility of thought. So there's not things. one person out there that can help move the pendulum across. There's not one disruptor. <coughs> I don't see it. I mean, in a sense, I was a big political disruptor, and that disruption led to 
Brexit, and you can agree with it, disagree with it, but it worked. Mm. You know, um, it led to a debate on immigration, but that's now been ignored completely. Um, and I'm hopefully going to disrupt the financial uh, model that we're living under mm. in, in a positive way for all, I hope yeah. uh, and believe. Um, but no, there is no disruptor out there. And the trouble is our, our system is set. You know, we don't have open primaries. So, you know, an outsider like Trump can't come into British politics. It just, just literally can't be done. So you think um, the whole s political system needs a shake up then? Oh, I, I think we're in a catastrophic place with it. I promise you, whatever the rhetoric, the actual choice next year is very limited indeed. Whoever's in government, they won't be very much different. They really won't be much different. But, as I say, you know, in the late 70s, a new philosophy came along and something will come along. I don't know when, but something will come along. But we're not in a good state. And what really worries me, Rob, are the number of young people that are leaving. You know, Lisbon's become a very attractive destination. You know, tax... I know loads of young people going to Marbella, going to Dubai, yeah. etc. in their droves, literally. Yeah, no, in their droves. Yeah. yeah, the brain drain is back. It's the first time we've had it. Well, in the 70s, it was... It was brain drain? The brain drain. In the 70s, young people qualified as doctors, accountants, and just left the country. Right. Australia was sort of one of the number one destinations. America, yeah. equally a very popular destination. By the way, Australia's back as a very popular destination. Because if you're a doctor, it's double the money in Australia. Wow. Double the money in better weather. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, yeah, the brain drain, it was known 15 right. years ago. And, that, and we're back with that. And we're losing a lot of young talent. And, you know, the tax burden just goes up and up and up. If you look at, you know, direct taxation, indirect taxation, the monstrosity they put on small businesses. What's the indirect taxation? You mean all the stealth taxes? Oh, you mean what you all pay, the, what you pay. Just try to get into central London. No, but I mean, you, know, you, you buy a pint, you buy a packet of fags, you fill the car up. Oh, I, mean, yeah. I mean, huge, yeah. Double huge, tax on fuel. Huge, yeah. indirect, let alone inheritance tax, which of course now is taking double the money it was five years ago. So many people who would not consider themselves to be wealthy families have been trapped by IHT. Right. Um, well, and because and, the, and, and the what, thresholds aren't yeah, that's right. They're increasing in line. They're yeah. They're I mean, Which now, is a form of tax in a way. For now, the property market has stalled, but you know, it's been going up and up and up and yeah. up and up. Um, so it's difficult. And, and interestingly, I mean, Liz Truss, well, I mean, for all her failings as leader, actually, a lot of what she said, I agree with 100%. Mm. She was talking about taxes coming down. She was talking about incentives, and I really think that you know, in this calendar year, to put corporation tax up by thirty percent, it's just the wrong signal. It's just the wrong signal. Yeah, you know, wrong signal. You mean going up from eighteen to twenty-five, which is yeah. a thirty percent rise? Thirty percent rise. Yeah, yeah, because you've already got you got charge VAT, corp tax, uh, income tax. Uh, You're at fifty-two and a half percent before you even blink. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. So why would you want to risk your own yeah. capital to set a company up that might succeed, might fail? If it, if it fails, you lose your dough. If it succeeds, they take half of it every year, a bit more away from you. <coughs> you've got a student loan to pay off. You're, if you've got a student loan to pay off, you're up to 60% tax. Yeah. I mean, it really is painful. Business rates. All of Pension it. contributions. And so, and so Lisbon looks yeah. attractive. Lisbon looks very, very right. attractive. Dubai you know, looks attractive on that. Dubai, yeah. does, Dubai does as well. Um, but Lisbon works because there's nobody in London on Mondays or Fridays now anyway. Nobody here. Work from home. More productive, old boy. Cobblers. <laughs> Absolute cobblers. <laughs> Just means you walk the dog. Yeah. You know? <laughs> One of my staff members you know. left and, and said, I want to work from home mm. so I can take the dog out for a walk yeah. every morning yeah, yeah. and walk yeah. my child yeah. to and from school. Yeah. And it's like, I wouldn't have had the gall to say that to no, my no, no, employer. No, now it's, yeah. sort of, it's sort of understood. Yeah, that yeah. It, yeah, 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 yeah. But, you know, Sorry, yeah. so you can, you can work in Lisbon, have a great tax deal with, with, the, with the Portuguese authorities. You can get an early six o'clock in the morning flight into Gatwick or Heathrow, right? Work all day Tuesday, Wednesday in London. Have all the meetings you need, all the face-to-faces and sit-downs that you need. Go back at 10 o'clock on Wednesday night and do that every business week of the year and still qualify under the number of days. Wow. <laughs> you, know, yeah. you can see it. You yeah. can see it. So we have to turn this around. Um, and it's a malaise. Yeah, it's a malaise. Why can't anyone in government see this? Liz Truss did see it. I'm, 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 and then, they, then she, I'm speaking she up lasted through. Oh, I'm, I spoke up for yeah, her. Yeah, I, was, it, you know, I, mean, I think she had the right vision, quasi 
quiet saying, who's a lovely man. Uh, I really always have a huge laugh when I see him. Uh, a bit too academic, perhaps, and trying to do too much too soon. It's a bit like the old Morecambe and Wise joke, isn't it? The famous Christmas special with Andre Previn, the conductor, and Eric Morecambe says, oh, I'm a concert pianist. And so Previn does the big dun da 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 and then Malcolm starts playing the piano, you know, incredibly badly. <laughs> and Previn says to him, I'm sorry, Mr. Eric, you're playing all the wrong notes. And he grabs him by the collar and says, no, Sonny, I'm playing all the right notes, just not necessarily in the right order. <laughs> <laughs> and I felt the quieting budget was like that. Right, yeah. They were all the right signals, but we were doing too much, too quickly. Uh, the market wasn't ready for it. Mm. Although, funny enough, you know, those market rates have been far worse since then, mm. um, uh, fr from that perspective. So, yeah, I, I don't want to be a council of despair. I'm not a council of despair. I think we will t come out of this. And, I, and, I, and I, want, I, you know, I genuinely believe that as Brexit Britain, we have the ability to make things worse or better for ourselves. But I think in the end, we can come to the right conclusion more quickly, perhaps, than our friends in Brussels. Mm. Uh, the other thing to look for that's really interesting is this, and slightly off beam for this podcast, but it's a thought I want to put in people's minds. China is in big economic trouble. Things are really, really changing. You know how a house price in Britain got to like nine times average earnings? Eight, nine, probably still about eight times mm. average earnings. In Beijing, it reached 35 times earnings. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's like you need five of the family to work. <laughs> yeah, to, yeah. A yeah. massive, speculative boom in China. Uh, Chinese banks, everybody overgeared, over leveraged in ways that we can't even begin to comprehend. And now the downturn and, and, and the contraction is coming. Uh, we are buying far fewer Chinese goods mm. than we were. Uh, already there are some quite big property collapses that have happened in China already. Yeah. I suspect a lot more to come. Um, and the real worry there is if Xi Jinping really gets it. Oh, by the way, youth unemployment, 21%. Wow. And that's a Chinese figure. That's a Chinese state figure. So you think it's <laughs> Yeah, you probably had a bit onto that. VAT. And so the real concern I've got looking ahead is if the economic downturn turns to be as serious in China as I now think it may well be, um, a Taiwan invasion becomes more likely. Right. And that would be the mega event in the world that would happen next year. Um, and so I, that, that is slightly scary. Yeah. But I, you know, it's, it, it would be a classic thing, wouldn't it? Trouble at home. Yeah. Seek a foreign adventure. And that's something that we've got to look for uh, going ahead from here. Um, and it's very much on my mind. Wow. Mm, big stuff. Mm. Um, what do you think of the recent scandals around Hugh Edwards, Philip Schofield? Um, they, they, you may deem them as similar or different, but they were obviously hot news. Um, yeah, what are your thoughts? Well, I'm a broadcaster too. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been through some stick in the press in the years gone by. Um, some of it was true, some of it wasn't. It's the true stuff that hurts. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, look, Hugh Edwards, I feel a bit sorry for him, really. You know, it's... Um, Clearly, clearly someone trapped inside an image of himself that wasn't true. Mm. He's done nothing very wrong. I mean, the parents of that boy may disagree, but I'm not sure he did anything terribly wrong. The Schofield case, I think, is a lot more complicated. Is it? Mm, a lot more complicated, and I think, I think there was too much lying going on for too long over the Schofield stuff mm. uh, and over that runner that was working at ITV and yeah I didn't like the feel of the, the look of that very much at all. The Edwards thing, very sad, I mean he'd become our Dimbleby, now, he'd become the guy that, that, that you know on the coronation, uh, the Queen's funeral, mm. he, was the, he was the senior statesman of the BBC, so for him it's a bit of a personal tragedy and he obviously can't come back from this very easily. Um, but it shows the dangers you see, I mean if you go into public life in any way at all, you will not get away with anything. We're living in an internet age. Everywhere you go, every phone can record you, can video you. You know, the standards of people going into public life, whatever it is now, are much higher than they ever were before. 
Um, it's, uh, it's the standards, how do you mean? As in they have to be whiter than white, cleaner than cleaner? Yeah, you just can't do stuff that you did before. You know, I mean, people, get, people, look, people used to get away with, I mean, public figures, big sports figures, I mean, they got away with murder in years gone by. They mm. just can't do that anymore. Yeah. Can you imagine a group of Premier League footballers going out, you know, the girly bars in the West End? They all used to do it. Mm. Couldn't do that now, could they? No. Just couldn't, I'm not saying they should, yeah. but they couldn't do that now. Um, I'm, I mean, I'm obviously, you know, not a nervous person by disposition, but even I'm pretty thoughtful. Mm. Pretty thoughtful where I go, what I do. People walk up in the street and speak to you. They think, well, you know, are they friend or foe? Mm. So yeah, it's um, it's um, it's been tough. It's been tough for Edwards particularly. Mm. Uh, can you imagine it? Mm. Imagine going through that. Yeah, the Schofield stuff should have broken years ago. We all, I mean, we all knew about it in 2019. Right. But one of those stories that took a long, long time. And why do you think it takes took so long? Oh, because people just keep quiet and it's difficult for the press to write about it unless someone says something. And there's always a trigger that you look right. for. Um, mm. it's, it's, although I will say this, the mainstream media, or someone called gutter media, are not as intrusive as they used to be. The Leveson rules have given people some protection in their private lives. And I think, I think to be honest, uh, I think people's children should be off limits, which they weren't before Leveson and now they are. And some of the stuff we used to have, you know, long range photography, taking pictures of people around a swimming pool on private property. None of that stuff should ever have been published mm. and it wouldn't get published today. So I think actually the relationship between the media and politicians and public figures is probably in the right place now. Yeah. But it's, it's not the newspapers directly that famous people have to worry about. It's the average Joe on the street with his camera. Right. So yes. it's, you know, it's, it's, <clears throat> you want to be famous, it comes with a, it comes with a downside. Mm. And how do, you, how do you handle that, being a divisive character and having haters? And, um, yeah, I mean, in some ways that cheeses me off, because I, I, you know, I don't hate people who disagree with me. I think they're deluded. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I'll quite happily, I'll quite happily sit and talk. So you don't hate someone for their opinion, but it seems like so many people do hate someone I don't hate opinion. Animal Rising. I was blooming annoyed at the Grand National that they delayed the start and all those horses fell at the first two fences. Yeah. But I can sit and talk to somebody from Animal Rising. Yeah. I don't hate them. No. I disagree with them. Mm. Um, do you think would the world would be a better place if we could not hate people for their opinions? We didn't used to. No. We didn't used to. We and didn't is this part used of to. The, the, the move of see, freedom of speech? You see, I think that... I think that that the, 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 the experience of two world wars taught people that the enormous price was paid so that we could disagree with each other. Yeah. You know? Mm. Uh, uh, but not loathe the other person for having a different opinion. And, and is this linked to why we have more wokeism? Because... Yes. Yes. We, yes. Uh, yes. We don't have enough to do. We don't have enough... Yeah, I mean, I mean it, 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 people become... I mean, for example, David Cameron introduced gay marriage, right? No manifesto commitment to do so. Even Stonewall at the time weren't asking for it. He introduces gay marriage and he passed his parliament. On Wednesday, it's perfectly acceptable to say you're opposed to gay marriage. By Thursday, when it's become law, it's hate speech to say you're opposed to gay marriage. Do you see what I mean? Wow, yeah. and, and that's how people, groups of people with opinions suddenly find themselves the wrong side of the argument, the wrong side of the law. And the mob kind of hates them. And, mm. it's, and it's very difficult for people to speak out, you know, without being attacked. And we see this running through the advertising industry. You know, any, I mean, a lot, a lot of free speech channels on radio and television, you know, the advertisers get attacked by the mob. The mob, the left-wing mob that we have today, don't want to, don't disagree with me. They don't think I should exist. You know, I shouldn't have a right, I, you know, I'm not entitled to my opinions. And that's a big problem that we're facing. And again, it's very much come from America. And, and for those of us on my side of the line, you know, it needs great resilience mm. to stand up and fight this stuff. Free speech is important. Freedom of association is important. These are values that we used to believe were absolutely fundamental. And they're under threat. And, and an alarming number of young people coming out of university 
literally hate people with different points of view. It's not good. No. Not good. Because, uh, that, that will take a long, long time. And I, I think, you know, reform of the education system, uh, more objectivity, genuine critical thinking. You know, where, you know here are two positions. Yes. And you choose which is yours, but understand what the other one is, is and why. And I think we've, we've lost a lot of that. Mm. Too much. Yeah. Um, do you think Donald Trump's innocent of the... Um... <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I, I, mean, I think what happened in Georgia, I mean, you know, the idea that you use racketeering laws, I mean, it's just complete nonsense. Mm. Yes, he says to a guy on the phone, find me some more votes. Al Gore did the same thing in 2000 in Florida. Mm. Do you remember that? You know, nice. Bush and Gore, neck and neck for the American presidency, hanging chads, dimple chads, all sorts of stuff going on. You know, Gore had a whole team mm. working with him to try and overturn the result in Florida. Trump does it, suddenly it's racketeering and 18 of them are facing charges. Mm. Um, I think Trump has to win these cases. Do you on, think he will? On the grounds of the First Amendment. The First Amendment is your right to free speech. It's enshrined mm. in America. Did Trump believe he was cheated out of the election? Yes. He genuinely believed he was cheated out of the election. Many around him genuinely believe he was cheated out of the election. I was deeply alarmed at tens of millions of ballot papers just being chucked out like confetti in the post wow. all over America. I've seen postal voting fraud in Britain, big time, in Peterborough. Saw it in Peterborough. I fought a court case over it. Didn't I wasn't win. born there, so. Didn't, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I might live no, there. No, I but I, you know, I didn't yeah. win. Yeah. But I know what happened was crooked. I know what happened was bent, but you try and prove it. It's not easy. No. Um, now, you know, Perhaps, he, perhaps he's banged on about it too much and for too long, mm. but I think he has to win these cases on the, on the basis of the First Amendment. If he doesn't, well, I fear for America. Why? Uh, because if half the population think what is happening is wrong and dishonest uh, and lose total faith in a democratic system, well, you know, we have democracy so that we can not fight each other so that we can agree at the ballot box and sort of things. Okay, Rob, you've won, you've got your five years, you know? Mm. But I'm going to beat you next time. Yeah. That's, how de that, that's how democratic elections work. Mm. But you both respect the system. And you have to have losers' consent as well. I mean, that's one of the problems we had here, is that the Remainers never accepted the loss. Mm. And Trump is being accused, you know, of not giving losers' consent. And, and I understand why that argument gets made. I, too, have my deep doubts about some of those, about some of those postal districts in America. I, I wouldn't go as far as to say it was a stolen election. I just think the rules weren't in place, mm. state by state, to stop some of this you know, ballot harvesting, etc. Right. Um, but, yeah, it's a big worry. If they put Trump in prison, it's a big worry for where America goes. Mm. Big worry. I think, you know, if, if, if I'm right about the results of these cases, he'll be president next November. He'll win. Wow. Do you know, most people who I know or have seen who know Donald Trump well speak very highly of him. Mm. So why, what is misunderstood about him? You see, isn't, again, we're back to this sort of, really, what, what, one of the themes that's run through this podcast. There's Trump, all-American hero, big guy in New York, guy that took on the mafia, built skyscrapers, had some huge successes, had some terrible business failures, incredibly beautiful wives. You know, I mean, the Trump brand. And then one day, in 2015, he comes down an escalator in Trump Tower and announces he's running for the Republican nomination, and they hate him. They hate him. Because... Well, his business books were so successful in, yeah. in the 80s and 90s. Because liberals, yeah. modern-day liberals, hate anybody with a different point of view. Right. They loved him as an all-American hero. Mm. They loved him on the telly. The real, I mean, reality TV was made for Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah. The Apprentice. I mean, wow, how yeah. good was that? Mm. We've got Alan Sugar, he's all right, but Trump, wow. Yeah. Mega. Mm. And then he comes out as a conservative and they hate him. They've never, ever, ever let it go ever since. Right. And does he make mistakes? Look, you know, I've spent plenty of time with him. You know, he's a larger than life personality. Yeah. When I'm with him, I find him very funny. <laughs> Pretty outrageous. Yeah. I mean, you know, he's a New Yorker, mm. for goodness sake. Um, and his resilience, his resilience after what they put him in. I mean, I was put through a fair bit 
you know, I've been through the Russia hoax and all this stuff, but mm. not, to a, not to the same degree that he has. No. Uh, his resilience is, is amazing. Uh, sometimes, yeah, he says things I think, mm, mm, mm. <laughs> <laughs> I might keep a bit low profile today. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that's, I'm sure, my most ardent supporter, mm. when I was in politics, would say, well, sometimes Nigel, God, uh, you, went a bit, you went a bit too far there, or whatever. You know, we're all human beings. Yeah. And, we, you know, we, we judge each other on getting things right and getting things wrong. Mm. But he's a very loyal friend. Yeah. You know, I, know people that are, I know people that have known him 30, 40 years, played golf with him, stayed with him at Mar-a-Lago, and they all say the same thing. He's a very, very good friend. Mm. And it's kind of, it's the old fashioned way of doing business, isn't it? You trust mm. people, you trust people, mm. you know. Um, Biden is an absolute disgrace. In what regard? Oh, I think the levels of potential corruption within that family are just astonishing. Really? Right? Yeah. The fact that Hunter Biden has earned 20 blooming million from Russia and its satellites over the course of the last few years, when, you know, he's a drug addled nobody with no business experience whatsoever, picking up all these contracts. And if you believe the testimony given by his business partner the other day, you know, Joe Biden as vice president had, was on 20 of those phone calls. Wow. I mean, you know, and in 2020, in 2020 in the election, uh, that stuff did not get any coverage. The Hunter Biden laptop got no coverage because social media companies decided to shut it down. The New York Times decided to shut it down. Had Musk been there, Twitter would have run this stuff or allowed, or allowed debate on this stuff and the outcome might have been different. And if the election was stolen, that's where it was stolen. It wasn't a free and open debate about potentially what was going on financially within that family. And he's clearly on the verge of senility. Uh, his withdrawal from Afghanistan two years ago directly led to the invasion of Ukraine. And the man's a disaster. And crime is rampant in many American cities. So, you know, America needs to turn around too. How has humanity got to this point? What are we doing wrong? Oh, we've got we, we've got we've got it wrong many times before, I and mean, we're very good at getting it wrong. <laughs> yeah. you know? The world's been in a far worse place than it is now. Mm. <laughs> you know, yeah. we sort of have to relatively remember that, and mm. and, and and you know, um, the West has lost confidence in itself. It doesn't really quite know who it is, uh, what it is. When you look at the foundations of the West and what the West was built on. Basically, and I'm not, you know, but, you know, I'm not a God Squad, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not, I'm not a Sunday regular, but I, but I do have some basic belief, and I do think that the Judeo-Christian underpinning and roots of our culture and our civilization is what it's all about. It's what everything. I mean, you know, basically, our legal system started with the Ten Commandments. Well, I was going to say that yeah. that's a pretty good way to live your life, isn't it's it? It's a really? very good way to live yeah. your life. And, and no, absolutely. Mm. You know, and I, and I have great. You know, I, I hate the way that often Christian communities are now being discriminated against. I really loathe that. But I think that a Western society that has lost touch with its roots and its foundations, I think that's a very fundamental part of what's gone wrong. Do you think we're seeing a shift whereby less and less people have faith? There, there's more atheism. Um, there is definitely more. Well, more agnosticism, mm. probably. I think it's a better way of putting it. Uh, yeah, I mean, the census figures on this are quite revealing. You know, the number of people who have sort of lost basic faith. Mm. But human beings need leadership. When you give human beings leadership, you give them something to believe in. We've not had Christian leadership. Arguably, Pope John Paul, you know, going back a little bit, the Polish Pope was someone that gave the Catholic Church great leadership. The Church of England has been a complete catastrophe. This will be bloke, don't even start me on him. Um, you know, I mean, just awful. Again, playing politics, playing politics, getting involved in the cross channel stuff. He shouldn't be doing any of that stuff. Um, his Christmas Day sermons, I mean, I have to control myself. Um, you know, leadership, I mean, take England cricket, now don't laugh, don't laugh. Joe Root, you know, one of the most outstanding batsmen we have ever produced. Will, by the time he retires, set a record that goodness knows how many decades it'll take to beat. Great cricketer, great gentleman, behaves beautifully. I think I know where you're going with this. Really good ambassador for the mm. sport, great role model to young kids. Took a few wickets this year too with his yeah, team, yeah. You know? But not Ben Stokes. But he was captain. The last 17 test matches he was captain. We won one game. 
and in comes this buccaneering. <laughs> <laughs> I've met him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But this buccaneering leader who says, we know, not, not only can we do this, we're going to mean, well, do this. And we've won 11, uh, 10 mm. out of 12 test matches. And they have a philosophy. There is a core There belief. is a culture, there yeah. is a vision, yeah. there yeah. is a philosophy. There is a core belief. We are going to yeah. play exciting yeah. Yeah. cricket. Yeah. We're going to be aggressive. Yeah. Uh, it, like, we made the Ashes. I, I know England, Australia, it's England and Australia, but yeah. the way we played the game oh, made fantastic. the Ashes. Yeah, and if it hadn't been for the rain, but anyway. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If you want to do a sports podcast next week, we will. Okay, great. Um, I had, uh, I had Jeffrey Boycott in the box all day. Did you? Awards. I did. He was with right. us all day. It was yeah. very entertaining. <laughs> yeah. I can't say all of it in public. But no. The, the, <laughs> no, leadership. Mm. Give, people, give people leadership. Give them something to believe in. And the England cricketers believed in this philosophy mm. that he and the coach McCullum had come up with. And that's what the West needs. Well, look, how, look what it brought out of Moeen Ali. Yeah. Look yeah. what it brought out of Jack Leach. Oh, who, the belief that... that they fantastic. Given, yeah. So that's what we're lacking. That's the missing ingredient. Do you think that and someone who's got some entrepreneurial flair, I would love in my lifetime to see someone run our country who's got some entrepreneurial mm, flair. So would I. Do you think we will ever see that? I don't know. I just don't know. Not without fundamental reform. Our politics needs As to in reform. anyone being able to come it's in. A cl- it's a yeah. closed shop. It's a closed shop. Yeah. It's a closed shop. No open primaries. First past the post electoral system. Uh, funding rules that make it very, very tough for anybody new with money to come in. Right. Um, it's a closed shop. It, it needs, and I think the public know this. It's quite interesting. When you poll the public on electoral reform, it's not, you know, there's obviously many issues higher on people's agendas, but actually the growth of support for electoral reform is really quite something. I mean, if we had a referendum tomorrow kicking out the House of Lords, <laughs> it really? would be a very interesting result. Yeah, I think, look, you know, a House of Lords that is filled up with mates of Prime Ministers and party donors, I mean, it's a blooming disgrace. Mm. It's a disgrace. But is the pen- could the pendulum swing? I think... This will be the thing that will keep me in the UK. Yeah, and I think... Um, you know, the first part of the post-electoral system works well when there are two profound political philosophies in the country. You know, socialism versus conservatism, liberalism versus Toryism. It's not like that now. Now, you now have people who still, the, the Corbynites, who believe in socialism. You have the Green um, uh, agenda, who believe we're all going to die, and we should just ride bicycles and live in caves. Well, it's fine, you know, and wear, <laughs> and, and wear hemp, and it's fine. And no, no, but, no, but uh, you know, I'm teasing, but, but they believe in it. Yeah, yeah. And they should be entitled to vote for it. Mm. At the moment, you know, they, they had one MP. You had the UKIPers that I led, four million votes and one seat. I mean, that, that, you know, it's nuts. Mm, yeah. um, and clearly the Conservative Party would split. You'd get the free marketeers uh, would split against the corporatists. Mm. You know, you'd get the pro-China, anti-China, all that stuff. And I think, I think an electoral system where we all felt our vote would count would completely revive political debate in Britain. Mm. There'd, be a mu- there'd be a greater multiplicity of views in Parliament and yes, it would mean more coalition governments, but so what? What's wrong with that? Yeah. People, people, if people are forced to work together in the national good, I would say it's a good thing, not a bad thing. Mm. So I think electoral reform will come. And when we get that electoral reform, somebody will come along. I mean, look, you know, if we had the Italian system, you know, I could do, the, I could do a Giorgio Maloney. I'm not as good looking, obviously, but, <laughs> but, but no, I mean, you know, I could get... I think in that system, and I, I, I think at my peak, I could have got 25% of the votes mm. in the country. I genuinely do. Mm. Um, do you know what? I'd probably get it. I'd probably get very close to it now. Right. I would. You know. But but what can I do? Let's say the system was reformed. Would we see you? <coughs> I need a long, hard drink first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, I'm never going to say never. No. But you know something? In the last couple of months, I think I might have achieved more using media and social mm. media yeah. and my ability to, and my, hopefully my ability to explain things to people in ways that they understand. Mm. I might have done more doing that and with this ongoing campaign than I could ever do in politics. Wow. So I'm pretty happy where I am. Yeah. Wow. All right? Yeah. So can we finish on a quick fire round, Nigel? Yeah, go on. Okay, we've got a bit of a fun one here. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> all, all the questions you don't like are <laughs> <laughs> So we're going to do a would you rather round. Oh, God. <laughs> 
Would you rather have one million cash or one million engaged extra followers on social media and why? Oh, one million in cash. Ah. Why? Yeah. Oh, just because, you know, I spent 21 years in the European Parliament. I had four kids. Uh, you know, I came, out of the, I, I came out of 20 years of politics with my savings all gone. Right. All yeah. gone. Yeah. They're literally all gone. Yeah. People think, oh, you must have made a fortune. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> take the cash. <laughs> no. Yeah. So I'd probably take the cash. Yeah. Okay. Great. I'm honest. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, would you rather listen to Jordan Peterson or Andrew Tate and why? I... I think Jordan Peterson, because I think he's a lot more rounded. I think Andrew Tate is a fascinating figure. I think he, speaking to men who, because of the woke agenda, are told they can't be male mm. in any way at all was an important thing. But I feel some of his comments were pretty horrible. Mm. Jordan has a much more coherent intellectualism to what he does. and. You know, we said earlier that the Ten Commandments were important rules for life. Well, actually, his 12 rules for life are pretty good rules, mm. and I rather agree with them. Mm. Okay. Would you rather marry Greta Thunberg or Hillary Clinton? And oh! <laughs> Sorry. No, I'd go gay. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I don't know whether that's really the answer either. Um, oh, gosh. I, I, I just, I can't even imagine. Um, <laughs> I really can't even imagine what... I mean, you know the things that Hillary said about me? Oh, my God, yeah. On live, national... Uh, live what national did she say? Press con tw in the run-up to the presidential election, 16, a live national press conference. I was a white supremacist extremist wow. from England. Yeah. And then she said I was funded by, funded by the Kremlin. Right. Funded by the Kremlin. So I couldn't possibly marry Hillary. Um, Gressa, oh, she's too young. I couldn't marry someone that I, I couldn't marry someone that age. Mm. Could I marry somebody who had you know hard, greeny views? Yeah, mm. possibly. Mm. They would first couple of weeks be right. <laughs> <laughs> would you rather interview Andrew Jones or David Icke, and why? I, I think probably Icke in a way, um, just because he because the stuff he did before now was really interesting. Mm. You know, he's a good goalkeeper yeah. at Leicester City. Um, and he had, you know, we discussed the BBC earlier. He had quite, a, I mean, quite an important position at the BBC. Mm. So I suspect Ike. Um, I'd like to try and, I'd love to get to the bottom of how some of these ideas came into being. Um, you know, the lizards and all that. Mm. I mean, like, very interesting. Mm. But he has a following. Mm. He does have a following. And some of the things he says, of course, some of the things he says, I think, oh, well, that's interesting. And then he says stuff, I think, no, 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 no I can't live. But anyway, I mean, you know, in terms of a life journey, how do you go from being a trusted face by millions on the BBC to be, to, to be considered to be one of the most eccentric people in the country? And yet, you know, he can fill the Brixton arena. Mm. Interesting, isn't it? It is. Very interesting. Um, does money buy happiness? No. No, absolutely not. But having no money at all can make you very, very unhappy. So it's a balance here, and you have to get it right. You know, living financially on the edge is blooming miserable, and there are millions of our fellow Brits going through this right now, mm. really going through this. I live in the North Downs in Kent, where Greater London extended in the 60s. We're right on the ULS. I've never seen people so scared and worried about the £12.50 a day. Mm. Yeah, they, they can't afford it. No. They, the matter to me, I've got a nice car. You know? Yeah, yeah. So, so, no. And having lots of money, brings huge problems. Mm. I mean, a lot of very, very wealthy people have terrible internal family disputes and mm. security issues. But I have to say, you know, here I am today, and we're several years on from being an MEP. Well, I really was, uh, you know, I couldn't, I mean, I had to protect my kids because of my public profile, which meant private schools away from everybody. You know, I mean, I. You know, my outgoings are more than my income for many, 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 many years. And you see everything you've saved whittled down and think, God, you know, can't buy a new car, can't go on holiday. And I've been through all that. Mm. Um, and now I've got a decent income. Yeah. And, you know, one hopes, touch wood, that your health, mm. you know, because none of us know, no. that your health survives and you can have a decent retirement at some point. Oh, I never retire, but you know, I'm just kidding myself really. But, 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 but no, having financial security mm. does make you a lot more content when you wake up in the morning. Mm. And I would just, it's funny, isn't it? I'm not sure we're, I'm not sure we're inculating in young people 
that success is a good thing. No, well, this is, I find this a big problem yeah. where money yeah. is a dirty word in this yeah. country. Yeah, ambition's gone. Yeah. You know, you, you know, you, you know, and everyone wants to just sort of chill and be happy. Mm. Uh, um, um, so, no, I think aiming for, finan I think aiming for financial security stroke success, and that's the right way around. Mm. What would you say is your biggest mistake? Oh, there are too many to list, really. Um, I've made lots of mistakes. Lots of mistakes. In my personal life, lots of mistakes. Um, can um, you give us an exclusive, no, Nigel? No, yes, you can. No, <laughs> no um, oh, I don't know, I suppose. Do you know what I really think is this? I think that we're all good at something. We need to find what it is. I was really lucky. I found what I was good at, but I wish I'd found it much earlier. And what would you say you're, you're good at? Communicate. Mm. Communicate. Being with, physically with people, or online, or whatever it is, but I think I'm good at communicating. And I think people, you know, when I say things, I think people say, well, we agree with him, we disagree with him, but you mm. know what, he really believes it. Mm. That uh, was and, and, and I think, I think I wish I'd learned that skill earlier. I wish, yeah. I'd know, I wish I'd known in my teens that that was the thing that I was really good at, and I didn't. I found out later, so I've been fortunate. I think some people go through their lives and never find the thing they're good at. Mm. So I was fortunate, but I wish I'd, I wish I'd discovered it earlier. Mm. Dale Carnegie, Warren Buffett, they both talk a lot about the ability to communicate and public speaking as mm. their, um, one of their major <coughs> life skills. Do we teach public speaking at school? I bet we don't. We don't teach, do, we, do we teach money properly at no, school? No, nothing. Nothing. No. We're sending people out completely ill-equipped yeah. to cope with the world. You well, know? Yeah. Well, I don't want to... Um, if I open that loop of the education system, we'll be here. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe we'll save that for another, this is the quick another round. So keep going. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but you didn't, you didn't share a mistake. You politically... No, you I've made... I, the biggest mistakes I've made in life are to trust people right. that have let me down. Mm. You know, and that happens in you. And has that made you m more sceptical and hardened? Yeah, it happened in business. It happened personally, obviously, as it happens to all of us. Mm. Uh, it happened in politics. And that's one of the most hurtful things in life. People that you trust mm. that then go behind your back and let you down. Um, and I don't know. I suppose I'm very instinctive. I'm very instinctive. I either like people or they don't, and I get it right sometimes. I mean, I, we have this thing called the Farrar 7 out of 10 rule. As long as I'm right 7 times out of 10, we'll be okay. <laughs> but the 3 can hurt. Yeah. Um, no, I, do you know what? Actually, I'm still very trusting. Mm. I still probably say far too many things to people I don't know that well. Mm. Well, is that not ni a nice thing? Because I've um, also had my fair share of being screwed around or yeah. messed around, yeah. but I'm still a very yeah. trusting person. I quite like that about <coughs> yeah, myself. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I trust people too easily, mm. but, uh, but yeah, seven out of ten. Mm. Three and ten are going to hurt you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's your biggest regret? I, I sometimes think about this, because I'm going to be 60 next year, and you know, I've survived a plane crash, had cancer, been through a massive road traffic accident where I smashed to bits and spent months in hospital. Um, not lived the cleanest of lifestyles. Well, I'm not, you know, not in too bad a nick, but... Mm. So you, I, often, I have thought to myself, you know, I wonder what, you know... If you knew the end was coming, and you look back at your life, what would you regret? Um, I think there is one thing I will regret. I can't change it, but I wish I'd been there more for my children, really. But, you know, pursuing the kind of single-minded careers uh, that I've pursued, uh, working abroad, uh, whether it was in the European Parliament or in America on business or whatever it was, um, and I think, you know, you perhaps wish you'd been able to spend... I mean, I still value very much the time I do spend with them. Mm. I still see a lot of them, the grown-ups, you know, obviously. Mm. Um, but I guess that's a regret. Mm. But at least you can't, I don't, you know, I don't think, I just don't think you can't do both. No. It's very, I mean, it's a problem that women face more than men, actually. Mm. Yeah, I think women have this terrible dilemma of being the main one responsible for bringing, which is, a, which is the case in most households. Mm. Not all, but most. 
and they've got this terrible dilemma of trying to bring the family up, but if they want to pursue their career as a lawyer or whatever it is, I think more women than men probably would look back in life later and say that, mm. I guess. Mm. And to finish, what's one thing you're most excited about and one thing you're most scared about for our future or your future? Oh, the thing I'm excited about is my current campaign, of course. <laughs> you know, because I'm, I mean, you know, when, when and by the way, I didn't choose this campaign, it chose me. Mm. It was just one of those funny things that this happened to me and you start to realise, hey, this has happened to loads of people and there's no one to speak for these people. I'm going to be their spokesman. Mm. So this, this campaign picked me, but no, when I'm on campaigns, I'm always absolutely buzzing. Mm. You know, I mean, I sort of look at the alarm clock, it's four o'clock, shall I get up? Yes, yeah, get up. You know, four mm. o'clock in the morning, I'm downstairs in my dressing gown, going through stuff, you yeah. know. Um, so, yeah, I'm really enjoying this. Mm. What am I scared of? Mm. Oh, I'm scared of war. Of course. It's been mankind's folly ever since the dawn of time. And we've, you know, we, we've lived through, well, we have lived through British soldiers dying in Iraq and Afghanistan and elsewhere, and a huge number horribly wounded too. Um, we, but we've not, lived, we've not lived those war experiences that our grandparents and great-grandparents did. Um, Do you think that could happen in your lifetime? I'm scared of China. Mm. I'm very scared of China. Doesn't mean it will happen, but I'm scared. Mm. Ten years ago, China was a fairly insular country that went about its business the way that it did. Uh, under Xi Jinping, it's a very different place. And you only have to look at the growth of a Chinese navy, massive growth of a Chinese navy, but like the German navy in the early 20th century growing. Look at all these little atolls that they're turning into landing strips in the South China Sea. Uh, their stated aims on Taiwan. Yeah, pretty, and, 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 and the fact that actually Putin is now effectively a Chinese proxy. That scares me. Mm. That this, scares me. this show is called Disruptors. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we've both been quite good at that. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's great to have you on. Thank um, you. A Again. Time, yeah? yeah. Yeah. Thank you for coming along. And I know you're really busy, really grateful. Um, where should people most follow you? I know most people probably do, but you know, where. Where should we follow you if we want to see what Well, I mean, I run a website, mfarage.com. Yeah. So there's a load of stuff on the website. And, you know, I mean, obviously Twitter, I'm very active. Mm. Um, and what's the, the, the handle for oh, that? Nigel uh, underscore Farage. Yeah. Um, but I'm also, also, you know, YouTube. I'm busy. I mean, YouTube. There's a lot of YouTube, particularly my GB News stuff. It gets mm. cut and clipped and put on YouTube. I'm about, to, I'm, I'm off to America next week. I'm going to go to the Republican event in Milwaukee when all the presidential hopefuls will speak. Mm. Um, I, Trump won't be there. It'll almost be a sort of runners and riders for the vice president. Watch out for a guy called Vivek Ramaswamy. Watch out for him. 37 years old, self-made entrepreneur, Indian parents. He was born in Ohio. Oh, he's more anti-woke than me. Really? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Right, we need and, to get and, him on the show. And he is, I think he's going to be one of the modern faces of conservatism. Now, if he bombs, in the debate next Wednesday, well, he's bombed. <laughs> but, but I have a, you know, it's rather like picking a derby winner in January. Right? <laughs> you know, it's not an easy thing to do, yeah. but, I, but I'm going to be looking at Vivac next week very, very carefully. Mm. Uh, I think he's got real brains. And I think conservatism needs to be updated. It needs, to, it needs, it needs a younger, fresher, more positive side to the argument. Mm. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, it's a possibility if he was Trump's running mate, it'd be very, very interesting. Mm. Very, very interesting. Um, so yeah, YouTube, GB News YouTube, Nigel Farage YouTube, and a lot of American content coming very shortly. Exciting. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Nigel. Cheers. Thank you very much. I'm standing with Nigel Farage and fighting against a cashless society and a central bank digital currency. If you'd like to show your support, make sure you like this video, subscribe to the channel, and turn the notification bell on.